We are continuing our series through the Minor Prophets. Uh, first, we did Jonah. Uh, last week, John taught through Amos. And now we're on Hosea. And we're actually going in these in chronological order. So if you've been reading these books in your Bible, you might notice we haven't been going in the order of the Bible, but we're doing chronological order from the first, second, and now the third. So we're on the book of Hosea. We don't actually know a lot about Hosea, the person. Everything we know about Hosea comes from the first three chapters of this book, Hosea. He is not mentioned outside of these first three chapters. But we'll see in the opening lines that Hosea was a prophet during the times of particular kings that are named in these opening verses. And these kings put his ministry in the 700s BC. So about 2,700 plus years ago. This is after the kingdom of Israel was divided into two parts. Um, under David, the kingdom had been united. The 12 tribes of Israel had been united into one kingdom. And then a couple generations later, the kingdom divided and divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom became known as Judah. So this is after that time period. And we talked about in the previous weeks, the northern kingdom was eventually defeated by the Assyrian Empire. And that happens during the time of Hosea. So Hosea is used by God to warn the people about the coming judgment of God through the Assyrians, but also to reassure them that God has not and will not abandon them or forget them. And more than that, God is going to do something incredible for the people of God even though they have been unfaithful to him and they've turned away from him again and again, he is going to send them a Messiah, a king who is going to redeem them. So the main point of Hosea is this. We are unfaithful, but God is faithful, loves us, and redeems us. That's the main point. So now let's look at the first few verses, first couple of verses of the book of Hosea. It says... The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, Go and marry a woman of promiscuity, and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So the first thing we see in this passage is that Israel is an adulterous nation. We see that because God has commanded Hosea to marry an unfaithful woman as an illustration to Israel. Now, for Christians and non-Christians alike, this sort of command from God can raise all sorts of troubling questions. How can God command Hosea to do something so awful? Here, God is commanding Hosea to go and marry this promiscuous woman who is going to continue being promiscuous even during their marriage. He's commanding Hosea to marry a woman who's going to cheat on him and even become a temple prostitute for a false religion. Now, if we think God's primary desire, even his moral <coughs> obligation, is to make us happy, then this command to a prophet seems to go against that. Okay? How can a how can he command his prophet to do something that the rest of us would certainly say, Hosea, don't do that. Okay, this is not going to lead to your happiness. Well, the answer is simple. God is ultimately seeking his glory. He wants us to be happy, but ultimately he wants us to be happy in him. If you love God and love God's glory, then you will be willing to endure tough things for God and his glory. And more than that, you will love doing those things, even though they're hard and you may not love them while they're happening. But you will love them when they glorify God. This is no different than when Paul said in Acts 9, uh, but the Lord said to him, and this is to Paul, or to uh, Ananias, sorry. When the Lord said to Ananias, go for this man, Paul, is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, God had chosen Paul to be the primary missionary of the early church. Paul was going to go out and spread the good news of Jesus. He ends up writing much of the New Testament. 
but God had chosen Paul to suffer a lot in that process. That was part of God's calling. God didn't say, I'm calling him, I want him to do these things, and maybe bad things will happen, or bad things will happen, they're just out of my control. No, God said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Suffering was part of God's calling for Paul. God had chosen him for that. If you read through Paul's writings, he's honest about the suffering, but he also says that he would gladly suffer anything for the glory of God. See, if you have a biblical view of heaven, these things aren't really problems anymore. Paul knew that his work was bringing more people into the kingdom of God. And he knew that all of this work and all of this suffering would be rewarded for eternity in heaven. Nobody is going to be in heaven asking God, why did you make my life on earth so hard? As Christians, we are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That is an inherently hard life. Now, we're not all called to the same difficulties. Our lives won't be hard in the same ways. But living for God means gladly enduring whatever it takes to bring glory to God. So God has no problem calling Hosea to something unpleasant. But now back to the passage. God tells Hosea to marry this woman as a symbol to the nation of Israel. During the rest of the book, God is going to outline the many ways Israel has sinned against God. But most especially, God is going to call out Israel's sin of turning to false Canaanite gods, especially God Baal. Okay, Baal was a Canaanite god of rain and agriculture. And since most people in Israel at this time were farmers, they started worshiping this pagan god of agriculture and rain because they thought this would help them have good crops. The people still claimed to be worshiping God, but they also added Baal to their pantheon. They became polytheistic. And they'd worship whatever gods might offer some sort of help to them, they thought. And as they worship Baal, they began to attribute the good things God had given them as gifts from Baal. So let's look at Hosea 2.8. In this verse, God compares Israel to an adulterous wife, and he says, She does not recognize that it is I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the fresh oil. I lavished silver and gold on her, which they used for Baal. So Israel is taking the good gifts of God, including gold and silver, and food, crops, produce, and they were using those gifts in their sacrifices to this false god, Baal. And even worse, Israel believed that those things came from Baal. God is the one who makes it rain, not Baal. God is the one who makes crops grow, not Baal. And yet these people are giving up their crops, they're giving up their gold, they're giving up their silver to Baal, believing that he is the one blessing them. So Israel was using the gifts of God to worship false gods. Now think about this within the marriage metaphor. It's like a husband buying his wife nice gifts, and then she re-gifts those things to the man she's having an affair with. Okay? That would be a double insult, to say the least. And God had been talking about this for centuries through the prophets. But over and over again, the people just kept returning to their false gods. And so here in Hosea, God has Hosea, the prophet, marry this adulterous woman to serve as a symbol to all the people about what they were doing to God. Hosea married a woman who kept returning to other men over and over again. She was unfaithful to Hosea, and she disregarded Hosea, just as the people of Israel had been unfaithful and disregarded God. And just as we often are unfaithful and disregard God, we continue to turn our backs on God and turn to sin over and over again. Now, we might not be worshiping a pagan god, but we are worshiping gods of consumerism, self-centeredness, anger, righteousness, envy, all these other idols that we put in the place of God. Whatever it is that draws our attention away from God and to this other thing becomes our false god, our idol. But as awful as that is, the story of Hosea ends with a promise and a hope for us. So let's look at chapter 3. But now, before I read chapter 3, I want to head off a question. Raisin cakes were used in a religious offering to Baal. I'm just going to head that off now. It'll make sense in just a moment. 
So let's read chapter 3. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, show love to a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I, brought, uh, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and nine bushels of barley. I said to her, You are to live with me many days. You must not be promiscuous or belong to any man, and I will act the same way toward you. For the Israelites must live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the people of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come with awe to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. So now, not only was Hosea's wife unfaithful, but she ended up selling herself into temple prostitution for the temple of Baal. And so Hosea was faced with the choice of just leaving her there, abandoning her, or rescuing her from this. She couldn't leave anymore. She's been sold into this sexual slavery. And so God told Hosea to go and rescue his wife. And he had to go and buy her freedom. He had to pay to get back his wife. His wife had become enslaved, and he redeemed her at a cost. Again, this is a symbol for Israel and for us. Remember, this is in the 700s BC, just before the Assyrians conquered Israel and enslaved them. But God is not going to leave them. He's not going to abandon them. He's going to rescue them, and he's going to bring his people back to him, and he's going to restore the kingdom. He's going to give them a new king, a king from the line of David. And when that happens, the people will come with awe to the Lord, awe of who he is and his goodness. And when this happens, it says here that it will be the last days. In other words, this new kingdom that God is going to restore under this new king will be the final kingdom with the final king. Because the promise for centuries had been that God would give us a king who would live forever and who would usher in a kingdom that would live forever. That had been the promise for centuries to Israel. So this story of Hosea and his wife is designed to point us to this eternal kingdom and this eternal king, Jesus. That's the story of the Bible. God created a people and chose a people, and yet over and over and over again, they rejected him. They went off on their own, but he never abandoned them. Instead, he promised them that he would bring them back and he would be their husband always. He promised to redeem them, to buy them back from slavery, and to give them an inheritance in an eternal kingdom. This is the gospel right here in Hosea. We see here the promise of Jesus for an adulterous people, for us. And we see here a future that we didn't deserve, but God will bless us with through Jesus. Now, so far, we've only been talking about the first three chapters of Hosea. And I mentioned earlier that everything we know about Hosea, the person, is in these three chapters. After this, the rest of the book is not about Hosea, but is Hosea's words to the people of God, about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God in spite of their sin. So chapter 4 begins with these words. Hear the word of the Lord, people of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth, no faithful love, and no knowledge of God in the land. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery are rampant. One act of bloodshed follows another. So this could be said of almost any time in Israel's history. During the time of the judges, if you've read through the judges, it tells us that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes over and over again. That's what we see here. Cursing, lying, murdering, stealing, adultery. It's the story of Israel, but it's also the story of our world today. America today is the story of all humanity. We're all sinners. We each go our own way. We reject God. And as we do, the entire world suffers the consequences of that. And so chapter 4 goes on and warns Israel of the coming judgment of God. They're going to be defeated by the Assyrians. And God says that the purpose of this is to make them realize that they are dependent on God. If they want to abandon him, they will see what it is like to not have him. But God also promised that he wasn't really going to fully abandon them. He was going to give them a taste of what it was like without him. But he would never truly leave them. In abandoning them to the, Israel, uh, to the Assyrians, God was not really going to abandon him. God was going to use the Assyrians to discipline Israel. But he was always going to be in control of everything. 
In the last chapter of Hosea, after proclaiming so much judgment, God said this, Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our iniquity and accept what is good, so that we may repay you with praise from our lips. So God is calling Israel to come back in repentance to him. And then God continues, I will hear the, heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned from him, Israel, the nation. God promised that he's going to heal the people. He will love them. His anger will be turned away. Now, how is that going to happen? Well, we know as Christians that this happens through the work of Jesus. As John 3.16 says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. In fact, not only does God say that he's going to heal the people, he says that he will love them. There are many more things that God promises uh, throughout this whole book. A key theme throughout this whole book is that God will. God will. Well, of course, you might be wondering, God will what? Well, he will do lots of things according to this book. The the promise that I will, followed by a promise, appears over and over throughout Hosea. Here's some of the promises of judgment. I will put an end to all her celebrations, her feasts, new moons and Sabbaths, all her festivals. He goes on. Oh, he goes on. I will devastate her vines and fig trees. And then in chapter 10, I will discipline them at my discretion. Nations will be gathered against them to put them in bondage for their double iniquity. But there are also promises, besides these promises of judgment, there are promises of good and blessing to come. God is faithful. He is not going to abandon them. God will not divorce his people, but rather he's going to go and ransom them, just as Hosea did. We already looked at 14.4. I will heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned from him. But there's also chapter 2. It says, I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. And there's 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol, that is death. I will redeem them from death. Death, where are your barbs? Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. Now look at that promise. God is going to redeem his people from death. Death will have no barbs, no sting. In other words, death will no longer be a threat to them. Now what can it mean for death to have no sting, to have no threat for you? It can only mean that God's people are going to live forever. That's the promise of eternal life. That's the promise of heaven. And this is going to come with the eternal king that was promised in chapter 3. For the Israelites must live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the people of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come with awe to the Lord and to to his goodness in the last days. So during Hosea's lifetime, the people of Israel were going to be conquered by the Assyrians. And that did not look hopeful. They knew this was coming. They were warned. They could see the Assyrian Empire amassing and getting closer to them. And God's prophet tells them this is coming. That does not look hopeful. The people deserve this judgment. They had abandoned God. They deserved to be abandoned by him. But even in this judgment, God was never going to abandon them. God made a promise to his people. He chose them and committed himself to them. And even when they repeatedly were unfaithful to him, he was always faithful to them. This isn't just the story of Hosea. Again, it's the story of the entire Bible. Here in Hosea, God uses marriage as a metaphor and a visual illustration of the relationship between him and his people. But that metaphor of marriage is also used in other places. Isaiah 54, 5 says, Indeed, your husband is your maker. His name is the Lord of armies, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of the whole earth. In Ephesians 5, we're told that marriage was created as an illustration of the relationship between Jesus and his church. 
Jesus is the husband and the church is the bride. And we talk about this every week, how our relationship with Jesus doesn't depend on our faithfulness to him, but on his faithfulness to us. Now, if you're a Christian and you're part of a church, you are part of Christ's bride. We're waiting for that marriage that's promised in Revelation. It's coming. Right now, we're waiting for our groom to return. But his return is guaranteed. Our relationship, our place in this relationship is guaranteed. Our place depends not on our faithfulness, but on his faithfulness. Like the people of Israel, we might turn away and sin over and over again. But his spirit in us always brings us back. His spirit was given to us as a guarantee of our salvation. Jesus always brings us back. And although we're soling, selling, we've sold ourselves and are selling ourselves back into slavery of sin over and over, Jesus bought us back with his one-time sacrifice. He bought us at the cost of his own blood. He died on the cross as a payment for our sins. 1 Corinthians says it this way, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. If you're a Christian, you belong to Jesus. But that's a glorious thing. He loves us and cares for us more than we can imagine. And he's promised us an inheritance greater than we can imagine. If you're here and you're not a Christian, well, maybe this is all new to you. Maybe you haven't heard any of this. Maybe you grew up in church and have heard this, but you never really trusted in Jesus. You never really turned to Jesus away from your sin. You never trusted in him as your hope and your salvation. If that's you, then you are invited into this marriage relationship. You can have a relationship with God. And that relationship isn't based on you being good enough, because you won't be. Even if you promise to follow God, you will fail over and over again. There will be times that you will forget about God and you will trust in other things. But if you belong to God, he always brings you back. To turn from your sin doesn't mean that you just will power your way into being perfect from now on. It means that you admit that you often do trust in other things rather than God. It, you admit that you often go your own way and reject God. And just like Hosea's wife, you get trapped into sins. We all get trapped into sin. And so turning away from sin and to God is just admitting that we can't fix the problem ourselves. Hosea's wife couldn't fix the problem herself once she was sold into temple prostitution. She had to be rescued. So what we do is we turn to Jesus and we trust in him to fix the problem. We trust in him to redeem us. That's the good news of Jesus. That's what we celebrate every week here at University Church. That's the basis for our lives as Christians. If you want to be part of all that, all you have to do is pray to God, which just means to talk to him, and admit that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself, and confess that you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. And then talk to one of us about how you can grow in your relationship with Christ. But now let's close with a prayer. Father, we come to you having been redeemed and bought by the blood of Jesus. We come to you because your spirit draws us, not because of anything good in us, but because of your goodness and your faithfulness. You sent your spirit into our lives. You changed our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. You drew us, you called us, you blessed us, you gave us the gift of faith. And now we, we just praise your name. We trust in you. We trust in the work of Jesus, the finished, accomplished work of Jesus. We confess that even now, even when we know you, we so often forget about you and turn to our own idols, whatever they may be. But you never abandon us. You are always faithful to us. You made a promise to us, and you will keep your promise. And so we proclaim your name. We praise you. We glorify you. We celebrate you. And we want other people to know about you. So help us as a church to be faithful. Help us to grow closer to you. Help us to know you better. And help us to proclaim your name and tell others about you. 
we just ask that you bless us as you always have and always will. That we know you will bless us because of your promises. And we thank you for your promises. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.